Section eight of Flappers and Philosophers by F. Scott Fitzgerald. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by M. B. The Four Fists. One. At the present time, no one I know has the slightest desire to hit Samuel Meredith. Possibly this is because a man over fifty is liable to be rather severely cracked at the impact of a hostile fist, but, for my part, I am inclined to think that all his hittable qualities have quite vanished. But it is certain that at various times in his life hittable qualities were in his face, as surely as kissable qualities have ever lurked in a girl's lips. I'm sure everyone has met a man like that, been casually introduced, even made a friend of him, yet felt he was the sort who aroused passionate dislike, expressed by some in the involuntary clinching of fists, and in others by mutterings about taking a poke and landing a swift smash in the eye. In the juxtaposition of Samuel Meredith's features this quality was so strong that it influenced his entire life. What was it? Not the shape, certainly, for he was a pleasant-looking man from earliest youth broad-browed with gray eyes that were frank and friendly. Yet I've heard him tell a room full of reporters angling for a success story that he'd be ashamed to tell them the truth, that they wouldn't believe it, that it wasn't one story but four, that the public would not want to read about a man who had been walloped into prominence. It all started at Phillips Andover Academy when he was fourteen. He had been brought up on a diet of caviar and bellboy's legs and half the capitals of Europe and it was pure luck that his mother had nervous prostration and had to delegate his education to less tender, less biased hands. At Andover he was given a roommate named Gilly Hood. Gilly was thirteen, undersized, and rather the school pet. From the September day when Mr. Meredith's valet stowed Samuel's clothing in the best bureau and asked, on departing, if there was anything else, Master Samuel, Gilly cried out that the faculty had played him false. He felt like an irate frog in whose bowl has been put goldfish. "'Good gosh!' he complained to his sympathetic contemporaries. "'He's a damn stuck-up Willie. He said, "'Are the crowd here gentlemen?' And I said, "'No, they're boys.' And he said, "'Age didn't matter.' And I said, "'Who said it did? Let him get fresh with me, the old pie-face.' For three weeks Gilly endured in silence young Samuel's comments on the clothes and habits of Gilly's personal friends, endured French phrases in conversation, endured a hundred half-feminine meannesses that show what a nervous mother can do to a boy if she keeps close enough to him. Then a storm broke in the aquarium. Samuel was out. A crowd had gathered to hear Gilly be wrathful about his roommate's latest sins. He said, oh, I don't like the windows open at night. He said, except only a little bit, complained Gilly. Oh, don't let him boss you. Boss me, you bet he won't. I open those windows, I guess, but the darn fool won't take turns shutting them in the morning. Make him, Gilly, why don't you? I'm going to. Gilly nodded his head in fierce agreement. Don't you worry. You needn't think I'm any old butler. Let's see you make em. At this point the darn fool entered in person and included the crowd in one of his irritating smiles. Two boys said, Lo, Meredith. The others gave him a chilly glance and went on talking to Gilly, but Samuel seemed unsatisfied. Would you mind not sitting on my bed? he suggested politely to two of Gilly's particulars, who were perched very much at ease. Huh? My bed. Can't you understand English? This was adding insult to injury. There were several comments on the bed's sanitary condition, and the evidence within it of animal life. What's the matter with your old bed? demanded Gilly truculently. Oh, the bed's all right, but... Gilly interrupted this sentence by rising and walking up to Samuel. He paused several inches away and eyed him fiercely. "'You and your crazy old bed,' he began. "'You and your crazy—' "'Go to it, Gilly,' murmured someone. 
Show the darn fool. Samuel returned the gaze coolly. Well, he said finally, it's my bed. He got no further, for Gilly hauled off and hit him succinctly in the nose. Yeah, Gilly! Show the big bully! Just let him touch you, he'll see! The group closed in on them, and for the first time in his life, Samuel realized the insuperable inconvenience of being passionately detested. He gazed around helplessly at the glowering, violently hostile faces. He towered a head taller than his roommate, so if he hit back he'd be called a bully and have half a dozen more fights on his hands within five minutes. Yet if he didn't, he was a coward. For a moment he stood there facing Gilly's blazing eyes, and then, with a sudden choking sound, he forced his way through the ring and rushed from the room. The month following bracketed the thirty most miserable days of his life. Every waking moment he was under the lashing tongues of his contemporaries. His habits and mannerisms became butts for intolerable witticisms, and, of course, the sensitiveness of adolescence was a further thorn. He considered that he was a natural pariah, that the unpopularity at school would follow him through life. When he went home for the Christmas holidays he was so despondent that his father sent him to a nerve specialist. When he returned to Andover he arranged to arrive late so that he could be alone in the bus during the drive from station to school. Of course, when he had learned to keep his mouth shut, everyone promptly forgot all about him. The next autumn, with his realization that consideration for others was the discreet attitude, he made good use of the clean start given him by the shortness of boyhood memory. By the beginning of his senior year Samuel Meredith was one of the best-liked boys of his class and no one was stronger for him than his first friend and constant companion, Gilly Hood. 2. Samuel became the sort of college student who in the early nineties drove tandems and coaches and tally hoes between Princeton and Yale and New York City to show that they appreciated the social importance of football games. He believed passionately in good form. His choosing of gloves, his tying of ties, his holding of reins were imitated by impressionable freshmen. Outside of his own set he was considered rather a snob, but as his set was the set it never worried him. He played football in the autumn, drank highballs in the winter, and rode in the spring. Samuel despised all those who were merely sportsmen without being gentlemen, or merely gentlemen without being sportsmen. He lived in New York and often brought home several of his friends for the weekend. Those were the days of the horse car, and in case of a crush it was, of course, the proper thing for any one of Samuel's set to rise and deliver his seat to a standing lady with a formal bow. One night in Samuel's junior year he boarded a car with two of his intimates. There were three vacant seats. When Samuel sat down he noticed a heavy-eyed laboring man sitting next to him who smelt objectionably of garlic, sagged slightly against Samuel, and, spreading a little as a tired man will, took up quite too much room. The car had gone several blocks when it stopped for a quartet of young girls, and, of course, the three men of the world sprang to their feet and proffered their seats with due observance of form. Unfortunately, the laborer, being unacquainted with the code of neckties and tally hose, failed to follow their example and one young lady was left at an embarrassed stance. Fourteen eyes glared reproachfully at the barbarian. Seven lips curled slightly. But the object of scorn stared stolidly into the foreground in sturdy unconsciousness of his despicable conduct. Samuel was the most violently affected. He was humiliated that any male should so conduct himself. He spoke aloud. "'There's a lady standing,' he said sternly. That should have been quite enough, but the object of scorn only looked up blankly. The standing girl tittered and exchanged nervous glances with her companions, but Samuel was aroused. "'There's a lady standing,' he repeated rather raspingly. The man seemed to comprehend. "'I pay my fare,' he said quietly. Samuel turned red and his hands clinched, 
but the conductor was looking their way, so at a warning nod from his friends he subsided into sullen gloom. They reached their destination and left the car, but so did the laborer who followed them, swinging his little pail. Seeing his chance, Samuel no longer resisted his aristocratic inclination. He turned round and, launching a full-featured dime-novel sneer, made a loud remark about the right of the lower animals to ride with human beings. In a half-second the workman had dropped his pail and let fly at him. Unprepared, Samuel took the blow neatly on the jaw and sprawled full length into the cobblestone gutter. "'Don't laugh at me!' cried his assailant. "'I've been working all day. I'm tired as hell!' As he spoke, the sudden anger died out of his eyes, and the mask of weariness dropped again over his face. He turned and picked up the pail. Samuel's friends took a quick step in his direction. Wait! Samuel had risen slowly and was motioning back. Sometime, somewhere, he had been struck like that before. Then he remembered. Gilly Hood. In the silence, as he dusted himself off, the whole scene in the room at Andover was before his eyes, and he knew intuitively that he had been wrong again. This man's strength, his rest, was the protection of his family. He had more use for his seat in the streetcar than any young girl. "'It's all right,' said Samuel gruffly. "'Don't touch him. I've been a damn fool.' Of course it took more than an hour or a week for Samuel to rearrange his ideas on the essential importance of good form. At first he simply admitted that his wrongness had made him powerless, as it had made him powerless against Gilly. But eventually his mistake about the workmen influenced his entire attitude. Snobbishness is, after all, merely good breeding grown dictatorial. So Samuel's code remained, but the necessity of imposing it upon others had faded out in a certain gutter. Within that year his class had somehow stopped referring to him as a snob. 3. After a few years, Samuel's university decided that it had shone long enough in the reflected glory of his neckties, so they declaimed to him in Latin, charged him ten dollars for the paper which proved him irretrievably educated, and sent him into the turmoil with much self-confidence, a few friends, and the proper assortment of harmless bad habits. His family had by that time started back to shirt-sleeves through a sudden decline in the sugar market and it had already unbuttoned its vest, so to speak, when Samuel went to work. His mind was that exquisite tabula rasa that a university education sometimes leaves, but he had both energy and influence, so he used his former ability as a dodging halfback in twisting through Wall Street crowds as a runner for a bank. His diversion was women. There were half a dozen, two or three debutantes, an actress in a minor way a grass widow and one sentimental little brunette who was married and lived in a little house in Jersey City. They had met on a ferry boat. Samuel was crossing from New York on business, he had been working several years by this time, and he helped her look for a package that she had dropped in the crush. "'Do you come here often?' he inquired casually. "'Just a shop,' she said shyly. She had great brown eyes and the pathetic kind of little mouth. I've only been married three months, and we find it cheaper to live over here. Does he, does your husband like being alone like this? She laughed, a cheery young laugh. Oh, dear me, no. We were to meet for dinner, but I must have misunderstood the place. He'll be awfully worried. Well, said Samuel disapprovingly, he ought to be. If you'll allow me, I'll see you home. She accepted his offer, thankfully, so they took the cable car together. When they walked up the path to her little house, they saw a light there. Her husband had arrived before her. He's frightfully jealous, she announced, laughingly apologetic. Very well, answered Samuel, rather stiffly. I'd better leave you here. She thanked him, and, waving a good night, he left her. That would have been quite all if they hadn't met on Fifth Avenue one morning a week later. She started and blushed, and seemed so glad to see him that they chatted like old friends. She was going to her dressmaker's, 
eat lunch alone at Taine's, shop all afternoon and meet her husband on the ferry at five. Samuel told her that her husband was a very lucky man. She blushed again and scurried off. Samuel whistled all the way back to his office, but about twelve o'clock he began to see that pathetic, appealing little mouth everywhere, and those brown eyes. He fidgeted when he looked at the clock. He thought of the grill downstairs where he lunched and the heavy male conversation thereof, and opposed to that picture appeared another, a little table at Taine's with the brown eyes and the mouth a few feet away. A few minutes before twelve-thirty he dashed on his hat and rushed for the cable car. She was quite surprised to see him. "'Why, hello,' she said. Samuel could tell that she was just pleasantly frightened. "'I thought we might lunch together. It's so dull eating with a lot of men.' She hesitated. "'Why, I suppose there's no harm in it. How could there be?' It occurred to her that her husband should have taken lunch with her, but he was generally so hurried at noon. She told Samuel all about him. He was a little smaller than Samuel, but, oh, much better looking. He was a bookkeeper and not making a lot of money, but they were very happy and expected to be rich within three or four years. Samuel's grass widow had been in a quarrelsome mood for three or four weeks, and through contrast he took an accentuated pleasure in this meeting. So fresh was she, and earnest, and faintly adventurous. Her name was Marjorie. They made another engagement. In fact, for a month they lunched together two or three times a week. When she was sure that her husband would work late, Samuel took her over to New Jersey on the ferry, leaving her always on the tiny front porch after she had gone in and lit the gas to use the security of his masculine presence outside. This grew to be a ceremony, and it annoyed him. Whenever the comfortable glow fell out through the front windows, that was his congé. Yet he never suggested coming in, and Marjorie didn't invite him. Then, when Samuel and Marjorie had reached a stage in which they sometimes touched each other's arms gently, just to show that they were very good friends, Marjorie and her husband had one of those ultra-sensitive, supercritical quarrels that couples never indulge in unless they care a great deal about each other. It started with a cold mutton chop or a leak in the gas jet, and one day Samuel found her in Taines with dark shadows under her brown eyes and a terrifying pout. By this time Samuel thought he was in love with Marjorie, so he played up the quarrel for all it was worth. He was her best friend and patted her hand and leaned down close to her brown curls while she whispered in little sobs what her husband had said that morning and he was a little more than her best friend when he took her over to the ferry in a hansom. "'Marjorie,' he said gently when he left her as usual on the porch, "'if at any time you want to call on me, remember that I'm always waiting. Always waiting.' She nodded gravely and put both her hands in his. "'I know,' she said. "'I know you're my friend, my best friend.' Then she ran into the house, and he watched there until the gas went on. For the next week Samuel was in a nervous turmoil. Some persistently rational strain warned him that at bottom he and Marjorie had little in common, but in such cases there is usually so much mud in the water that one can seldom see to the bottom. Every dream and desire told him that he loved Marjorie, wanted her, had to have her. The quarrel developed. Marjorie's husband took to staying in New York until late at night came home several times disagreeably overstimulated, and made her generally miserable. They must have had too much pride to talk it out, for Marjorie's husband was, after all, pretty decent. So it drifted on from one misunderstanding to another. Marjorie kept coming more and more to Samuel. When a woman can accept masculine sympathy, it is much more satisfactory to her than crying to another girl. But Marjorie didn't realize how much she had begun to rely on him, how much he was part of her little cosmos. One night, instead of turning away when Marjorie went in and lit the gas, Samuel went in too, and they sat together on the sofa in the little parlor. He was very happy. He envied their home, and he felt that the man who neglected such a possession out of stubborn pride was a fool and unworthy of his wife. 
but when he kissed Marjorie for the first time she cried softly and told him to go. He sailed home on the wings of desperate excitement, quite resolved to fan this spark of romance, no matter how big the blaze or who was burned. At the time he considered that his thoughts were unselfishly of her. In a later perspective he knew that she had meant no more than the white screen in a motion picture. It was just Samuel, blind, desirous. Next day at Taine's, when they met for lunch, Samuel dropped all pretense and made frank love to her. He had no plans, no definite intentions, except to kiss her lips again, to hold her in his arms and feel that she was very little and pathetic and lovable. He took her home, and this time they kissed until both their hearts beat high, words and phrases formed on his lips. And then suddenly there were steps on the porch, a hand tried the outside door. Marjorie turned dead white. Wait, she whispered to Samuel in a frightened voice, but in angry impatience at the interruption he walked to the front door and threw it open. Everyone has seen such scenes on the stage seen them so often that when they actually happen people behave very much like actors. Samuel felt that he was playing a part and the lines came quite naturally. He announced that all had a right to lead their own lives and looked at Marjorie's husband menacingly as if daring him to doubt it. Marjorie's husband spoke of the sanctity of the home, forgetting that it hadn't seemed very holy to him lately. Samuel continued along the line of the right to happiness. Marjorie's husband mentioned firearms in the divorce court. Then suddenly he stopped and scrutinized both of them. Marjorie in a pitiful collapse on the sofa, Samuel haranguing the furniture in a consciously heroic pose. "'Go upstairs, Marjorie,' he said, in a different tone. "'Stay where you are,' Samuel countered quickly. Marjorie rose, wavered, and sat down, rose again and moved hesitatingly toward the stairs. "'Come outside,' said her husband to Samuel. "'I want to talk to you.' Samuel glanced at Marjorie, tried to get some message from her eyes. Then he shut his lips and went out. There was a bright moon, and when Marjorie's husband came down the steps, Samuel could see plainly that he was suffering. But he felt no pity for him. They stood and looked at each other a few feet apart and the husband cleared his throat as though it were a bit husky. "'That's my wife,' he said quietly, and then a wild anger surged up inside him. "'Damn you!' he cried, and hit Samuel in the face with all his strength. In that second, as Samuel slumped to the ground, it flashed to him that he had been hit like that twice before, and simultaneously the incident altered like a dream. He felt suddenly awake. Mechanically, he sprang up to his feet and squared off. The other man was waiting, fists up, a yard away, but Samuel knew that though physically he had him by several inches and many pounds, he wouldn't hit him. The situation had miraculously and entirely changed. A moment before Samuel had seemed to himself heroic. Now he seemed the cad, the outsider, and Marjorie's husband, silhouetted against the lights of the little house, the eternal heroic figure the defender of his home. There was a pause, and then Samuel turned quickly away and went down the path for the last time. 4. Of course, after the third blow, Samuel put in several weeks at conscious introspection. The blow years before at Andover had landed on his personal unpleasantness. The workmen of his college days had jarred the snobbishness out of his system and Marjorie's husband had given a severe jolt to his greedy selfishness. It threw women out of his ken until a year later when he met his future wife, for the only sort of woman worth while seemed to be the one who could be protected as Marjorie's husband had protected her. Samuel could not imagine his grass widow, Mrs. de Ferriac, causing any righteous blows on her own account. His early thirties found him well on his feet, he was associated with old Peter Carhart, who was in those days a national figure. Carhart's physique was like a rough model for a statue of Hercules, and his record was just as solid, a pile made for the pure joy of it without cheap exhortation or shady scandal. He had been a great friend of Samuel's father, but he watched the son for six years before taking him into his own office. 
heaven knows how many things he controlled at that time mines railroads banks whole cities samuel was very close to him knew his likes and dislikes his prejudices weaknesses and many strengths one day carhart sent for samuel and closing the door of his inner office offered him a chair and a cigar everything okay samuel he asked why yes i have been afraid you were getting a bit stale stale samuel was puzzled you've done no work outside the office for nearly ten years but i've had vacations in the adirond carhart waved this aside i mean outside work seeing the things move that we've always pulled the strings of here no admitted samuel i i haven't so he said abruptly i'm going to give you an outside job that'll take about a month samuel didn't argue he rather liked the idea and he made up his mind that whatever it was he would put it through just as carhart wanted it that was his employer's greatest hobby and the men around him were as dumb under direct orders as infantry subalterns you'll go to san antonio and see hamill continued carhart he's got a job on hand and he wants a man to take charge hamill was in charge of the carhart interests in the southwest a man who had grown up in the shadow of his employer and with whom though they had never met samuel had much official correspondence when do i leave you'd better go tomorrow answered carhart glancing at the calendar that's the first of may i'll expect your report here on the first of june next morning samuel left for chicago and two days later he was facing Hamill across a table in the office of the Merchants Trust in San Antonio. It didn't take long to get the gist of the thing. It was a big deal in oil which concerned the buying up of seventeen huge adjoining ranches. This buying up had to be done in one week, and it was a pure squeeze. Forces had been set in motion that had put the seventeen owners between the devil and the deep sea, and Samuel's part was simply to handle the matter from a little village near Pueblo. With tact and efficiency, the right man could bring it off without any friction, for it was merely a question of sitting at the wheel and keeping a firm hold. Hamel, with an astuteness many times valuable to his chief, had arranged a situation that would give a much greater clear gain than any dealing in the open market. Samuel shook hands with Hamel, arranged to return in two weeks, and left for San Felipe, New Mexico. It occurred to him, of course, that Carhart was trying him out. Hamel's report on his handling of this might be a factor in something big for him, but even without that he would have done his best to put the thing through. Ten years in New York had made him sentimental, and he was quite accustomed to finish everything he began, and a little bit more. All went well at first. There was no enthusiasm, but each one of the seventeen ranchers concerned knew Samuel's business, knew what he had behind him, and that they had as little chance of holding out as flies on a window pane. Several of them were resigned. Some of them cared like the devil, but they talked it over, argued it with lawyers, and couldn't see any possible loophole. Five of the ranchers had oil. The other twelve were part of the chance, but quite as necessary to Hamel's purpose in any event. Samuel soon saw that the real leader was an early settler named McIntyre, a man of perhaps fifty, gray-haired, clean-shaven, bronzed by forty New Mexico summers, and with those clear, steady eyes that Texas and New Mexico weather are apt to give. His ranch had not yet shown oil, but it was in the pool, and if any man hated to lose his land, McIntyre did. Everyone had rather looked at him at first to avert the big calamity, and he had hunted all over the territory for the legal means with which to do it. But he had failed, and he knew it. He avoided Samuel assiduously, but Samuel was sure that when the day came for the signatures, he would appear. It came, a baking May day, with hot waves rising off the parched land as far as eyes could see, and, as Samuel sat stewing in his little improvised office, a few chairs, a bench, and a wooden table. He was glad the thing was almost over. He wanted to get back east the worst way, and join his wife and children for a week at the seashore. The meeting was set for four o'clock, and he was rather surprised at three-thirty when the door opened and McIntyre came in. 
Samuel could not help respecting the man's attitude and feeling a bit sorry for him. McIntyre seemed closely related to the prairies, and Samuel had the little flicker of envy that city people feel toward men who live in the open. Afternoon, said McIntyre, standing in the open doorway with his feet apart and his hands on his hips. Hello, Mr. McIntyre. Samuel rose, but omitted the formality of offering his hand. He imagined the rancher cordially loathed him, and he hardly blamed him. McIntyre came in and sat down leisurely. "'You got us,' he said suddenly. This didn't seem to require any answer. "'When I heard Carhart was back of this,' he continued, "'I gave up.' "'Mr. Carhart is—' began Samuel, but McIntyre waved him silent. "'Don't talk about that dirty sneak-thief.' "'Mr. McIntyre,' said Samuel briskly, "'if this half-hour is to be devoted to that sort of talk—' "'Oh, dry up, young man,' McIntyre interrupted. "'You can't abuse a man who'd do a thing like this.' Samuel made no answer. "'It's simply a dirty filch. There just are skunks like him too big to handle.' "'You're being paid liberally,' offered Samuel. "'Shut up!' roared McIntyre suddenly. "'I want the privilege of talking.' He walked to the door and looked out across the land the sunny, steaming pasturage that began almost at his feet and ended with the gray-green of the distant mountains. When he turned around, his mouth was trembling. "'Do you fellows love Wall Street?' he said hoarsely. "'Or wherever you do your dirty scheming?' He paused. "'I suppose you do. No critter gets so low that he doesn't sort of love the place he's worked, where he sweated out the best he's had in him.' Samuel watched him awkwardly. McIntyre wiped his forehead with a huge blue handkerchief and continued, "'I reckon this rotten old devil had to have another million. I reckon we're just a few of the poor he's blotted out to buy a couple more carriages or something.' He waved his hand toward the door. "'I built a house out there when I was seventeen with these two hands. I took a wife there at twenty-one, added two wings, and with four mangy steers I started out.' Forty summers I've saw the sun come up over those mountains and drop down red as blood in the evening, before the heat drifted off and the stars came out. I've been happy in that house. My boy was born there, and he died there, late one spring, in the hottest part of an afternoon like this. Then the wife and I lived there alone like we'd lived before, and we sort of tried to have a home. After all, not a real home, but nigh it, cause the boy always seemed around close somehow and we expected a lot of nights to see him running up the path to supper. His voice was shaking so he could hardly speak, and he turned again to the door, his gray eyes contracted. "'That's my land out there,' he said, stretching out his arm. "'My land, by God! It's all I've got in the world, and ever wanted.' He dashed his sleeve across his face, and his tone changed as he turned slowly and faced Samuel. But I suppose it's got to go when they want it. It's got to go. Samuel had to talk. He felt that in a minute more he would lose his head. So he began, as level-voiced as he could, in the sort of tone he saved for disagreeable duties. It's a business, Mr. McIntyre, he said. It's inside the law. Perhaps we couldn't have bought out two or three of you at any price. But most of you did have a price. Progress demands some things. Never had he felt so inadequate, and it was with the greatest relief that he heard hoofbeats a few hundred yards away. But at his words, the grief in McIntyre's eyes had changed to fury. You and your dirty gang of crooks, he cried. Not one of you has got an honest love for anything on God's earth. You're a herd of money, swine. Samuel rose, and McIntyre took a step toward him. You long-winded dude! You got our land! Take that for Peter Carhart! He swung from the shoulder quick as lightning, and down went Samuel in a heap. Dimly he heard steps in the doorway and knew that someone was holding McIntyre, but there was no need. The rancher had sunk down in his chair and dropped his head in his hands. Samuel's brain was whirring. He realized that the fourth fist had hit him 
and a great flood of emotion cried out that the law that had inexorably ruled his life was in motion again. In half days he got up and strode from the room. The next ten minutes were perhaps the hardest of his life. People talk of the courage of convictions, but in actual life a man's duty to his family may make a rigid corpse seem a selfish indulgence of his own righteousness. Samuel thought mostly of his family, yet he never really wavered. That jolt had brought him to. When he came back in the room there were a lot of worried faces waiting for him, but he didn't waste any time explaining. "'Gentlemen,' he said, "'Mr. McIntyre has been kind enough to convince me that in this matter you are absolutely right, and the Peter Carhart interests absolutely wrong. As far as I'm concerned, you can keep your ranches to the rest of your days.' He pushed his way through an astounded gathering, and within a half hour had sent two telegrams that staggered the operator into complete unfitness for business. One was to Hamill in San Antonio, one was to Peter Carhart in New York. Samuel didn't sleep much that night. He knew that for the first time in his business career he had made a dismal, miserable failure. But some instinct in him, stronger than will, deeper than training, had forced him to do what would probably end his ambitions and his happiness, but it was done, and it never occurred to him that he could have acted otherwise. Next morning two telegrams were waiting for him. The first was from Hamill. It contained three words. You blamed idiot! The second was from New York. Deal off. Come to New York immediately. Carhart. Within a week, things had happened. Hamill quarreled furiously and violently defended his scheme. He was summoned to New York and spent a bad half hour on the carpet in Peter Carhart's office. He broke with the Carhart interests in July, and in August Samuel Meredith, at thirty-five years old, was, to all intents, made Carhart's partner. The fourth fist had done its work. I suppose that there's a caddish streak in every man that runs crosswise across his character and disposition and general outlook. With some men it's secret and we never know it's there until they strike us in the dark one night. But Samuel's showed when it was in action, and the sight of it made people see red. He was rather lucky in that, because every time his little devil came up, it met a reception that sent it scurrying down below in a sickly, feeble condition. It was the same devil, the same streak, that made him order Gilly's friends off the bed, that made him go inside Marjorie's house. If you could run your hand along Samuel Meredith's jaw, you'd feel a lump. He admits he's never been sure which fist left it there, but he wouldn't lose it for anything. He says there's no cad like an old cad, and that sometimes, just before making a decision, it's a great help to stroke his chin. The reporters call it a nervous characteristic, but it's not that. It's so he can feel again the gorgeous clarity, the lightning sanity of those four fists. End of section 8 End of Flappers and Philosophers by F. Scott Fitzgerald